we want tokens um, that basically provide useful services. So when we think about blockchains and their native cryptocurrencies, we want this cryptocurrency price to go up if the blockchain is providing useful services. So in other way, we don't want like to have a cryptocurrency which are essentially generating value or uh, uh, getting values without any underlying fundamental reason. We would like to see cryptocurrencies which are generating value because their underlying blockchain is providing useful services to the users and to the economy. So I'm Agostino Capponi, an associate professor at Columbia University and the founding director of the Center for Digital Finance and Technologies. To pass a no-way test, uh, a security needs to derive utility from the effort of others. Uh, that's one of the requirements of the OWI test, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, traditional stocks pass the OWI test, because like, the shareholders uh, extract value from the effort of the managers of the firm. And in the case of crypto, this is what is less clear, like at least uh, if we think about proof-of-stake, proof-of-work bitcoins or proof-of-work cryptocurrencies, it's not, it's not so clear that the value that is being generated is being extracted from the effort of others. For this reason, I believe that uh, we cannot really claim uh, that uh, crypto is a security in the traditional sense of the term. And what like uh, the equivalent of the SEC would look like, in my view, remains still uncertain. Front running is one of the main risks that is faced in any public blockchain which supports smart contract functionalities and decentralized financial services. Every time you submit transactions through the public blockchain, these transactions, while pending, while waiting to be executed, are visible to everybody. So it's different from the traditional like um, stock exchange, where like transactions are only visible at the moment where they are executed. Here, in the case of public blockchains, you can really see the transaction pending and waiting for being executed. So that means that uh, front runners or attackers could screen the pool where all transactions are waiting to be executed and execute a front-running attack. For example, if you want to swap one token, uh, say a Bitcoin token for an Ethereum token, then I can be the front-runner. I can see that you intend to do this swap transaction and I can place a higher swap transaction ahead of you so that I pump up the price and they would execute at the price that you should have executed. So when it's your turn, you will basically buy one token for the other at a higher price and then I can back run you at that point where you have transacted, I can sell. So this is basically the front-running risk. And this is a risk which basically is uh, leading to a large amount of losses for all those users or arbitrageurs who are being front run by these malicious actors who are trying to scan the pool and take advantage of these opportunities. One of the remedies against this front running is has been exactly the private pool. So private pool means that instead of making the pool publicly available and visible to everybody, it becomes private. You submit your transaction directly to the validators who are going to execute these transactions. So nobody else except for these validators will be able to see the transactions. And one of the rules of the protocol is that these validators who are monitoring this private pool are not supposed to front run you. In this way, you get rid of the front running risk because now those screeners, those uh, uh, malicious actors are no longer able to see your transactions. And the question is, well, what is the role of the fee here? The fee uh, is that uh, in the case where you have private pools, what could happen is that arbitrageurs or uh, like uh, front runners who are looking for transactions to front run, they can still observe this transaction in the public pool and then they can use the private pool just to execute this front running because a front runner could be front run by another front runner. So if basically the front runners go to the private pool, you could, they could use this private pool as a way of competing, and this can raise the fee even more than what we are observing in the public pool. So that's like what, why like uh, this private pool solution is not yet like a solution which mitigates these negative externalities imposed by the the competition between front runners. There is um, another study that uh, that um, that I'm currently working on. We looked at the role of the fees as a mechanism to provide information. So basically uh, what happens is that uh, high uh, fee trade flows typically corresponds to informed trading. That's what we find in our studies, that if you are more informed, you are going to submit a higher fee trade because you want to trade on this information and you want to do it quickly before you are like exploited, before somebody else takes advantage of that same opportunity. So what we find is that high fee trade flows on blockchains are typically informed 
and also they are more responsive to public shocks. So if there is a shock observed, for example, based on public news about Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency or like any other like news about the crypto market, typically trade flows with high fees are basically more sensitive to these public shocks. So the transparency is a key concern precisely because it generates front running risk. The idea is that because the so transactions that are pending on the pool and waiting to be executed are visible to everybody. So that's full transparency. That's exactly the reason why we have front running because I can, be, I can basically take advantage and try to execute the same transaction as you and raise the price up. And the reason why I can do that is because these transactions are publicly visible to anybody. So any, every user of the blockchain will be able to see these transactions and they take this advantage, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So while transparency is good because you can monitor, you can you basically can see everything. You can base your trading strategy on a lot of information. It's also, it also has this uh, negative consequence coming from the fact that transactions on the public mempool can be front run. Here we have transparency in blockchain, both on the pending transactions and on the executed trade transactions. So even when a trade is executed, it's stored on a block and these blocks are visible to everybody. So if we think about agent welfare in the context of blockchain, we, have, we can think about like those users who could be front run, uh, those validators who are like uh, executing a service for the user by validating transactions. We can think about the front run, the front runners, those who are exploiting this front running opportunity. So if we think about the welfare of those users or arbitrageurs who could be front run, then they well, their welfare will go up if there is a private pool because the negative externality coming from front running risk will be mitigated. If we think about uh, validators, then if we think about validators who are adopting the private pool, then their welfare is also presumably supposed to go up simply because there is higher competition on fees by the front runners and therefore the validators will extract more value. If we think about those front runners, these will be the agents who will lose in terms of welfare if a private pool is introduced because no user is submitting through the public pool, then there will be nothing to exploit. So in this case, the welfare will never really go down. One way with, in our study, we think that this misalignment of incentive can be solved is basically incentivizing every validator to be on the private pool. Because if every validator is on the private pool, then uh, it means that uh, any user will never submit a transaction through the public pool because like, they, will, uh, they will always place, find validators who will be able to execute this transaction. So the only reason some users may decide not to submit to the private pool is if they don't see a lot of validators monitoring these pools, because then I will be subject to execution risk. I can't submit, but maybe the validator who gets to append the block is not monitoring the private pool. So that means that my transactions will have to wait more and more block to get executed. Now, once you understand that, uh, it's basically clear, or it's, um, it's a result that we show in our study that it's always optimal, like socially optimal, if all validators are monitoring the private pool, so that front running risk is completely eliminated. The reason is that why you need a subsidy to these validators to adopt this private pool is that it's not necessarily optimal for validators to all adopt the private pool. The reason is that if they all go in the private pool, then there will be nothing to front run. So all these fees that are being generated through the competition of the front runners will actually not be that high because the front runners will not be competing anymore with each other because they don't have anything to front run. So that means that the validators will not be better off by all going through the private pool. Now, the question is, we know that it's socially optimal if they all go through the, through, through the private pool. So how can we incentivize them to go there to the private pool so that we achieve the socially optimal outcome? And the way to do that would be for those users who could be front run to pay some fees to these validators. And this fee will essentially be the transfer that will incentivize all these validators to join the private pools. So in a way, what this, what this means is that uh, front runnable users or front runnable arbitrageurs, those who are subject to front running risk, are essentially paying for the usage of these private pools. So the centralized exchange is a new type of financial innovation that is essentially built on public blockchains and more specifically on public blockchains which support smart control functionality. One of the problems of the centralized exchange is that the pricing function that is used to determine 
the price at which you exchange one crypto token for another crypto token is basically specified by some function which mathematically is known to be convex, convex which basically means that uh, the marginal price of exchanging one token for the other goes up uh, as uh, the number of tokens that you are exchanging goes up. What happens, what we show also in our study, is that the convexity is a very important driver of liquidity provision and of social welfare. The reason is that if you have a very convex curve, it means that there is a large cost for trading. So if you trade with a very high convexity, it means that you pay a lot for trading. So if you are a user who is uh, deciding whether or not to trade, you might decide not to trade if you see that the curve is very convex because it's too costly for you to trade. On the other hand, if you have very low convexity, then many users will want to trade. But as a liquidity provider, you also need to counterbalance this fact that you are gaining from fees paid by the users who are trading with the cost that you might be arbitraged by arbitrageurs who are trying to profit from deviation between the price on the decentralized exchange and the price on the centralized exchange. So that means that uh, if it's very cheap to trade, both users and those arbitrageurs will have an incentive to, to transact. So while you are gaining from the fees of the users, you are losing from the cost of this arbitrageur taking wealth away from you as a liquidity provider. So you don't want the convexity which is too low. You also don't want the convexity which is too high because as I mentioned before, if the convexity is very large, then trading is very costly. So nobody will trade. The arbitrageur will not exploit you, which is good, but you will also not get any users who are trading. Therefore, the fees that you are gaining are basically zero and you don't want basically to run a service if you are not profiting from it. And what we show is that the sweet spot in, this, in the middle. So you want to have some degree of convexity, which is neither too low nor too high, just enough to incentivize. Now, what happens is that uh, this um, optimal curvature of the, of the pricing curve from the point of view of the liquidity providers is too high compared with what should be socially optimal. So if you ask like a regulator or a social planner to decide for the optimal convexity which benefits all the participants of this ecosystem, including liquidity providers, users, arbitrageurs, validators, then the answer is that you want some convexity, but this convexity should be higher than the convexity that is optimal for the liquidity provider. And here, when we think about convexity, we should really think about the cost of trading. So higher convexity means higher cost of trading. So that means that the optimal cost of trading from the social planner perspective should be lower than what is the optimal cost of trading from the liquidity provider's perspective. Both trading volume and volatility are basically very important ingredients because if we think about liquidity provision, then if you have a very volatile token pair, so if you're like exchanging tokens which are very volatile, it basically means that uh, there is a lot of arbitrage opportunities to be exploited. So more volatility means more opportunities for the arbitrageurs, which basically means more uh, wealth is being transferred from the liquidity providers to the arbitrageur, which means that their incentive to provide liquidity from the liquidity provider's perspective goes down with the volatility of the token pairs. On the other hand, if you have a higher volume, higher trading volume, which is many users are willing to trade because for private reasons, they need to trade and uh, get access to specific tokens. For example, some users may have to access the Ethereum blockchain. They want to swap and get Ethereum token because they want to use these tokens to execute the app on the blockchain. So then in that case, uh, it's good for the liquidity providers because these users are going to pay fees because trading volumes means trading fees because the fee is proportional to the volume that is being exchanged. Higher volatility means less liquidity provision or reduces the incentive to provide liquidity. Higher trading volume increases the incentives to provide liquidity. We want tokens um, that basically provide useful services. So when we think about blockchains and their native cryptocurrencies, we want this cryptocurrency price to go up if the blockchain is providing useful services. So in other way, we don't want like to have a cryptocurrency which are essentially generating value or uh, uh, getting values without any underlying fundamental reason. We would like to see cryptocurrencies which are generating value because their underlying blockchain is providing useful services to the users and to the economy.